pretty much ready to finish up Acts. So uh, we're on chapter 28, verse 11. <clears throat> so in the 1994 classic film, Shawshank Redemption, the story focuses on this man named Andy Dufresne, who has been accused of a double murder in the 1940s, and he's begun his new life with a life sentence at Shawshank Prison. And this is where he meets another inmate of his uh, that he eventually becomes friends with uh, named Red. And in one of the scenes in the movie, so this movie follows uh, Andy Dufresne and just kind of what's going on. In one of the scenes, he somehow hijacks the PA system and starts playing uh, some music that he found or that was uh, donated to him. And so he, he, he starts playing this opera music, hijacks the PA system, and just blasts the song throughout uh, the prison and the prison grounds. And so after when he gets, when uh, the, the, the police and the warden comes and gets him, he gets thrown into solitary confinement for two weeks, which uh, for those who don't know, well, not like I would, uh, solitary confinement apparently is one of the worst ways of punishment. So he's there for two weeks. And when he comes back, uh, the next scene he's back and he, he sits down for a meal and then the rest of his friends, his intimate friends, ask him, he goes, how was it? And he says it was the easiest two weeks in the hole. And everyone says, like, there's no way. You know, doing two weeks in the hole is incredibly difficult. How can he say it's easy? And he starts talking about how he had Mozart with him, he had music. And they go, what? They let you bring music in there? He goes, no. He says, it's in here. And it's in here. And they look at him. He's like, he's crazy. And like, what are you talking about? He's like, he's like, doesn't music make you feel that way? And they're like, not really. And it doesn't really make sense to him. And Red mentions how he says he used to play music. And he goes, it doesn't make much sense in here anymore. And Andy replies to Red, he goes, here is where it makes the most sense. You need it so you won't forget. Forget that there are places in the world that aren't made out of stone, that there's something inside that they can't get to, that they can't touch. It's yours. And Red looks at him and goes, what are you talking about? And Andy says, hope. So as we are in the end of Acts, as Paul is in prison, hope is also what is getting him through. But it's not the hope that comes from music, but comes from Christ. And this hope gives him the motivation to continue his journey of where God has called him, which is in Rome. And in this passage, we see that Paul has Christ, and that's where his hope comes from. And his hope in Christ is for all people. And all people can have it. Simply put, the big idea this morning, what we're getting to this morning is Christ is the hope for all people. I'll say it again, Christ, he is the hope for all people. So if you're taking notes, all you need to write down is Christ is the hope for all people. All right, let's get started. And first we see that Christ's hope brings believers into a family, that Christ's hope brings believers into a family. We're in Acts chapter 28, verse 11. It was after three months we sailed in a ship that had wintered in the island, a ship of Alexandria with twin gods as a figurehead. Putting, on, uh, putting in at Syracuse, we stayed there for three days, and from there we made a circuit and arrived at Regenum. And after one day, a south wind sprang up, and the second day, we came to Petoli. There we found brothers, and were invited to stay there with them for seven days. And so we came to Rome. And the brothers there, when they heard about us, came as far as the Forum of Appius and three taverns to meet us. On seeing them, Paul thanked God and took courage. And when they came into Rome, Paul was allowed to stay by himself with the soldier that guarded him. It's pretty amazing. As we've, we've, we've gone through pretty much all of Acts. We only have you know, a few more <laughs> verses left. And it seems like every time when Paul goes somewhere, especially this last leg of the trip while he has been in prison, believers seem to find him 
and spend time with him and just encourage him. And from what we know, most likely they never even met. I'm going, that is insane. That's just so cool that wherever he went, every step along in his journey, there are Christians who have known of him, known about him, decide, decides that they are going to go and spend time with this man they've never met, but because they know they have Christ in common, it brings a bond together. They know that they are all placing their hope in Christ. And when, they play, when, when we come together and when they're coming together, they go, Paul, I know Paul has Christ and Christ's hope. I have Christ and Christ's hope. And so that means we are in the same family. And we're all part of the same family. I remember uh, there was one summer I was taking an anatomy and physiology class when I was in college. And uh, in, in this anatomy class, we have, we have labs and we have to do all sorts of things. So um, remember that I had one of my labs um, and we, we had a TA there that would kind of conduct the lab and watch, watch over us. And so I remember after one, one time, like after, after lab one day as I, was, I walked out and I was walking back to the bus stop to take me back to uh, my apartment, and so as I was waiting by the bus, uh, waiting by the bus stop, waiting for the bus, uh, I see uh, the TA, who was not far behind me, he actually uh, was waiting for the bus as well. So we talked a little, we, got, we started talking a little bit. He's asking me, so, you know, what is your major? What are you doing? Uh, why, are you, why are you in this uh, anatomy class? You know, and I started talking to him. I told him that, you know, I was about to graduate and, you know, and he goes, oh, you know, that's, that's great. You know, that's exciting. Uh, what do you plan on doing? And, and you know, I, I, I'm assuming that he's thinking if I'm taking my anatomy classes, I has to probably do something with, I don't know, biology or something with, um, you know, in the medical field. And I, I told him, I was like, actually, I am planning on going to seminary. And he get, his eyes get really wide. And he looks at me and he goes, are you a Christian? And I said, yes, I am. And he goes, me too. <laughs> and he got so excited. He started asking me, he's like, what church do you go to? He goes, this is where I go to. And he's like, oh, uh, and, you know, what, where do you plan on going? What do you, this and that. And he got so excited. Like he was able to just start sharing these things with me. I go, for me, I was just kind of taken back and go, wow, he has, we have one common bond. Other than him being in the same class, you know, him being my TA, he's this Korean man that doesn't speak English very well. I don't know any, you know, like we, we don't talk. But our bond was Christ and Christ's hope. And for me, that was just amazing. So when we're here, at CFCC, here at the crossing, we talk a lot about crossing cultures and crossing generations. And we, and we, we spend a lot of time talking about how we want to cross our social economic barriers, that we want to cross you know, our, our life stages and, and every single thing about us that we want to come together. It isn't, we don't say these things because it's like the right thing to say or like the church thing to do is not because it's like the newest fad. It's not some pipe dream that we think that maybe that's what we should be doing because it just sounds right. We do it because that's the reality of following Christ. That's what reality of following Christ looks like. There are no social, cultural, racial, or generational barriers in Christ's family. To put up such barriers and boundaries, it just robs us of the rich, joyful community we can have in Christ. A community that declares that we have hope because we have Christ. And that hope is something that we can't keep to ourselves. And as we see, as Paul journeys, you see that these believers 
who have one common hope come together and paints this beautiful picture of no matter where we go, no matter where we are, when there are believers that are together, we're among family. So with this hope, we can't keep it to ourselves. And we see, second of all, Christ's hope not only binds us and brings us into a family, a family held by the Holy Spirit, but Christ's hope is also worthy to be shared. Christ's hope is worthy to be shared. We'll look and we'll start from verse 17. And he says, After three days he called together the local leaders of the Jews, and when they have gathered, he said to them, Brothers, do I have done nothing against our people or the customs of our fathers? Yet I was delivered as a prisoner from Jerusalem into the hands of the Romans. When they had uh, examined me, they wished to set me they wished to set me at liberty because there was no reason for the death penalty in my case. Because, but because the Jews objected when I comp, uh, when, when, but because the Jews objected, I was compelled to appeal to Caesar, though I had no charge to bring against my nation. For this reason, therefore, I have asked to see you and speak with you, since it is because of the hope of Israel that I am wearing this chain. And they said to him, Because we have received no letters from Judea about you, and none of the brothers coming here has reported or spoken any evil about you. But we desire to hear from you what your views are, for with regard to this sect, we know that everywhere is spoken against. When they had appointed a day for him, they came to him at his lodging in greater numbers. From morning till evening, he expounded to them, testifying to the kingdom of God and trying to convince them about Jesus, both from the law of Moses and from the prophets. And some were convinced by what he said, but others disbelieved. So we see the first thing what happens is Paul comes up and uh, when he gets to Rome, finally gets to Rome, he's, in, you know, he's under house arrest, First thing he does is what he does when he goes everywhere. He seeks out the local Jews. And part of it, he's seeking them out to make his defense. Right? He's going, I'm here. This is the reason why I'm here. And this is my defense. Like going, I, I didn't do anything wrong. I didn't do anything wrong. All, and all I was doing is talking about how the hope of Israel. I'm just talking about the hope of Israel. I'm talking about the Messiah that has been in scriptures. And that's why I'm in these chains. And that's why I'm here. And that's why I'm imprisoned. And what's really cool is that so the Jews, uh, you know, the, the, he probably gathered a whole bunch of leaders from the local synagogues. They came and they, they heard him out. And so I guess at that moment, at that time, they haven't heard much about him yet. They don't know what's going on. They don't, they don't know why uh, Paul is there. A lot of them speculate probably because of the storm and because you know how just uh, sailing has been really difficult for Paul. Must have been really difficult for everybody else as well. And so they haven't heard much from him yet. Pretty sure eventually they will, but at that time they didn't know much about him. But they go, you know what? We have heard about this Jesus guy, and we heard about this sect, about this this kind of like, you know the in our Jewish culture and our Jewish religions broke off to this, this, this group that, that keeps on talking about this Messiah. So we've heard about that. Because, but you know what? We don't know much about it. We've heard a lot of things and it doesn't sound like a great thing. We'll, we'll, we'll give you the opportunity to talk about him because we're kind of curious about it. And so what happens is that Paul actually has this opportunity, like with many other places and many other places he goes, he gets to share the gospel because the gospel is worthy to be shared. Because he has Christ's hope and he knows the hope that he has. And he even talks about the hope of Israel. That's why he's in chains. The hope of Israel. And he's going, I have the hope for you. And he wants to share it and tell them. And it says he spent the whole day expounding on scriptures, pretty much going, defending, going, this is why. 
Christ is, has come. This is who Scripture has talked about. He went, in, he went to the law of Moses. He looked at the Torah. He goes, look, in, in Moses, when he talks about this, 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 it's talking about Christ. And then he, goes, he even goes to the prophets, goes to the, the other books going. And, and when, when this person says this, he's talking about Christ. When Isaiah is talking about this, he's talking about Christ. When Joel's talking about this, he's talking about Christ. And he's kind of pointing out one by one, this is what they meant. And he goes, look, when they talk about all these things, in the, in the Psalms, when David was writing about this, it's talking about Christ. And you see this passion that Paul has, not just for, not just for like the hope that he has, but he wants to share with other people. He wants to share with people he loves and cares about. Like this is his people. This is the Jewish people. And he goes and he shares his hope that he has in Christ. Because Christ's hope is worthy to be shared. Christ's hope is worthy to be shared. So many people here, we, we might, uh, I don't know if you know, there's actually a secret restaurant in Disneyland. I don't know if a lot of people know. There's a, there is a secret restaurant in Disneyland. And you actually need a membership to get into this secret exclusive restaurant. In fact, I think in 2011, there was a 14-year waiting list to get a membership. A 14-year waiting list. And in 2012, for the first time in a decade, they reopened the waiting list. Right? The waiting list was closed for over a decade. So for an individual membership, I checked as I did my Wikipedia, the for an individual membership, the initiation fee is $25,000. And there's an annual fee of $10,000. And not only that, you do not get tickets into Disneyland. You get an opportunity to pay for a meal in the secret restaurant in Disney. So this is super exclusive, super high-end, not for normal people, right? So a few years ago, so Dana um, has some connections. <laughs> she has some connections. We clearly cannot get in ourselves, but she has some connections. So um, this, this, this restaurant is called Club 33. Club 33, you can look it up. And it's really cool. So Dana took me there for, uh, we've, I've gone there twice, uh, very fortunate. So the first time Dana took me there was for my birthday. And it's really cool. It's, in, it's like in uh, New Orleans Square. And people walk by all the time. It's right next to the Pirates of the Caribbean. And there's this just, there's little, there's numbers, right? Because it, it, it's a pattern it like it's a, um, I guess, in addresses. So there's 31, 32, and there's a 33. And it's a little bit bigger. It's a little shinier, but you wouldn't, know, you wouldn't notice the difference. And what you do is, when you get there, you have to buzz in. And then you go, hi, may I help you? And you tell them that you have reservations. And they, have, they unlock the door. Right? They buzz you in, and you open the door. And you have to hurry up in, because they don't want people to know about this place. So it's crazy. It is this insane place. So a couple years ago, so I, I, I've been there. I remember I went there. Um, uh, many years back, and then a couple years back, um, I wanted to run uh, the Disneyland Half Marathon. So Dana and I are very big Disney fans. And so I was like, hey, you know what would be really cool? If I, you know, I know that they have the Disneyland Half Marathon. Um, let's just, let's go. It would be really fun. And so we went down there, and a whole bunch of people from church went down there as well. And some of us uh, here at church actually ran it. And so, you know, we, we, were, we went down there for like a little mini vacation, and Dana goes, you know, since we're down there, well, let's, go, let's go to Club 33. I can, you know, try and make reservations. And um, not only she wanted to make reservations for us or for our family, she decided that she was willing to open it up for a lot of the people that were already there, that were coming down. Because she just thought, like, this is such a cool place. It's such a cool experience. There's no way that any of these people would be, ever, or would be able to get there. Right? She's the only one that can bring people in. 
And so she, and I go, all right, it's your choice. If this is what you want to do, that's great. You know, like, if you want to go through all this, that's fine. Uh, but I just told him, like, it's going to be a lot of work, you know. It's going to be, there's going to be a lot of organization involved. And she ended up bringing over 30 people into the restaurant. <laughs> over 30 people. She planned it. She was willing to go through the hassle, commitment, even, even the financial investment, because everything had to be pretty much paid up front. And she did all these things because she goes, this is an opportunity. It's, a, it's a literally a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity, and I want to share it with my friends. She felt like this experience that she had before was an experience that's worthy to be shared. And she was willing to do and go above and beyond because she goes, you know what, this is such a cool experience I want to share with other people. <coughs> and even more so, and even more accessible is the hope of Christ. Is the hope of Christ. That all of us have an opportunity to share this hope with other people because we have experienced Christ's hope. Because we know what that is and we know how rich, how amazing, how fulfilling, how satisfying it is. That we know that life is not the same and it's just this, this, this hope in Christ relationship with Christ is a, something that we can never attain on our own. But now that we have it and been given as a gift, it's something that we truly cherish. And so we have, if we have this hope and we actually know what it is and we've actually had this experience, we should desire to share it with others. If we've tasted and know what real hope is, you would want it for your friends and family. And I know you do. I know all of us who have placed our hope in Christ want our friends and family to experience the same hope. But now the question is, how far will we go to do it? How much sacrifice what it take? What are we willing to sacrifice to share this hope? And the cool thing is, is not this super exclusive club. There is no initiation fee. But all of that is all of that has already been paid for. But all what needs is a response is an opportunity for them to hear and know and see and experience from us. And we see that Paul has already been in chains. Why? For the hope of Israel. So all people can come to know him, to know Jesus, not to know Paul, to know Jesus. And he goes, this is why I'm in chains chains, but this is worth it. That's the sacrifice he was willing to make so other people can experience what he has experienced. 